It was 1917. The soldiers could feel the rising tension in the air. It was pitch dark, and everything was quiet and still. Gunner J.R. Armitage and his mates were fascinated by the spectacle surrounding them. Over 1,500 artillery pieces, 600 tanks, and four infantry divisions had converged in Amiens near the front line. The Germans had not spotted them. Armitage could hear the soldiers talking to their horses and the monotonous steps of men marching as they prepared for the attack. The artillery was also ready to strike 530 German guns when zero hour came. Finally, at 4.20 a.m., the attack began, and Armitage and his buddies went over the top to push the Germans back. As he later recalled, quote, We could feel that hundreds of groups of men were doing the same thing, preparing for the heaviest barrage ever launched. This was the beginning of the pivotal Battle of Amiens, a hard blow to German morale and a critical step towards the end of World War I. Out of Stamina On April 6, 1917, the United States declared war against the Prussian Empire. Realizing it was only a matter of months before tens of thousands of U.S. troops were sent to Europe to reinforce the Western Front, the Prussian military began to prepare a series of breakthroughs to destroy the Anglo-French defenses. If these troops were destroyed on time, Prussia still had a chance of winning the war, or at least negotiating better terms. But the ambitious operations dragged on, and the enemy held the line. In March 1918, Germany launched the Kaiserschlacht, the last Prussian offensive of the war. Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff relocated over 50 divisions from the Eastern Front and dispatched them to France after the Russian withdrawal from the war. As part of Operation Michael, the German troops advanced into the Marne River but failed to deal a decisive blow against the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF. Exhausted, demoralized, and starving, the German operations quickly lost stamina, and neither Arras nor Amiens were captured after stiff resistance from British and Australian soldiers. Supreme Commander Ferdinand Folk ordered an immediate counteroffensive against the underpowered Germans. The Second Battle of Marne resulted in a German withdrawal and put the Anglo-French forces back on the offensive. Following the triumph at Soissons, General Foch unveiled his plans to push the Germans out of the Saint-Miel salient and clear the way for railway lines that ran through Amiens. With U.S. troops under General John J. Pershing already in France, Foch knew it was time to expel the Germans from France. The Hundred Days Offensive Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, commander of the BEF, agreed to attack the Germans from the Somme, east of Amiens, as it was already the boundary between British and French forces. The BEF had plenty of seasoned troops from the campaigns in the Middle East against the Turks and the Italian front against the Austro-Hungarians. The Australian and Canadian Corps were contemplated for the push towards Amiens. The strike on Amiens relied heavily on tank warfare, employing large numbers to overwhelm the enemy. The Australians had successfully tested the new tactic during the Battle of Hamel. They believed they could do it on a large scale. Nevertheless, for the plan to succeed, total secrecy was required to keep the element of surprise. Thus, it was decided that the advancing Canadian and Australian infantry would not enjoy preliminary bombardments before the assault to soften the German defenses. The artillery strikes would begin once the combined force of tanks and soldiers launched the attack. The Canadian and Australian troops gathered over 1,400 howitzers and 700 heavy artillery pieces to rain hell on the Germans. General Budworth from the Australian Corps estimated the artillery would strike 504 out of 530 spotted German guns and emplacements within the first seconds of zero hour. Over 580 Canadian and Australian tanks were gathered for the assault. Each of the Commonwealth armies had a brigade of four battalions. The vehicles and four infantry divisions were discreetly transferred to Amiens without notice. On August 8th, the transfer was complete, and the Australian and Canadian forces were ready to launch the assault on the unsuspecting Germans. Muttered Curses The mist hung heavy in the air on the morning of August 8th, 1918. As narrated by gunner J.R. Armitage, quote, it was utterly still. Vehicles make no sound on the marshy ground. The silence played on our nerves a bit. As we got our guns into position, you could hear drivers whispering to their horses and men muttering curses under their breath. And still the silence persisted, broken only by the whine of a stray rifle bullet or a long-range shell passing high overhead. 
It was the beginning of the Battle of Amiens. Unlike previous assaults, this attack would not be heralded by a bombardment, allowing the Allies to maintain the element of surprise. Led by the intrepid General Henry Rawlinson, the 4th Army charged into battle with the British 3rd Corps attacking in the north of the Somme, the Australian Corps positioned in the center, and the Canadian Corps took up the south. A Royal Air Force squadron laid smokescreens over the battlefield, obscuring the attacking Canadians, while a heavy mist enveloped no man's land, concealing the impending attack. At the stroke of 4.20 a.m., 900 Allied guns opened fire, and the infantry surged towards the German lines. Tanks roared across the battlefield, and aircraft buzzed overhead, while the French First Army launched its preliminary bombardments. The Germans were caught off guard. Due to their recent incursions on the 6th, they had not expected such a coordinated and lightning-fast Allied assault. Winners and Losers By 7.30 a.m., the Allies had captured the first German position and had advanced 3.7 kilometers. Stunned by the ferocity and speed of the attack, the Germans were unprepared for the scale of the Allied offensive. Many surrendered at the first chance, and Allied soldiers fought their way through the woods to clear German machine gun positions and take prisoners. The tanks, struggling through boggy terrain and thick fog, lagged behind, but Canadian forces pressed forward, capturing several key targets. Infantry carrying Mark V tanks entered the fray, but the Allies had already penetrated deep into the German defenses, and cavalry continued the advance. Aircraft fire from the newly formed RAF and armored cars kept the retreating Germans from rallying. In parallel, the Allies achieved a significant victory. For months, they had tried to destroy a powerful German weapon known as the Amiens gun to no avail. Through the summer, the enemy had used it to fire on the city from 25 kilometers away. But that day, the Allies successfully bombed the train carrying the weapon, and the Germans had to flee the scene just as the advancing Australians arrived to claim the abandoned site. By 11 a.m., the Canadians and Australians in the center had pushed the line 4.8 kilometers forward from its starting point. North of the river, where the terrain was rougher, the British were less successful, but they still made significant gains. The British 4th Army captured 13,000 prisoners, and the French captured a further 3,000. In total, German losses reached 30,000. Down to Hell General Erich Ludendorff described the first day of Amiens as, quote, the black day of the German army in the history of this war. Everything I had feared, and of which I had so often given warning, had here, in one place, become a reality. It wasn't the lost ground. It was the pummeled morale of the Germans that was, quote, depressed down to hell. Nevertheless, Allied forces had pushed, on average, 11 kilometers into enemy territory, all in a single day. But the battle was only getting started. The Allies pressed forward through fields thick with tangles of barbed wire, abandoned trenches, and shell holes. The advance continued, though the second day lacked the spectacular results of the first. But the battle raged on, and the northern and southern flanks of the initial attack widened. The French forces engaged in the southern part of the battle, later known as the Battle of Montdidier, fought fiercely alongside their allies. The infantry pushed forward relentlessly, outrunning the supporting artillery and rendering the once mighty force of over 500 tanks to a mere six. Then, the Canadian front came across challenges, with congested roads and communication problems delaying the advance of the British 32nd Division. Meanwhile, the Chippy Spur remained in the hands of the enemy. German forces stationed on the ridge unleashed a hail of machine gun and artillery fire that pinned down the Australian Corps. Thus, the task of taking Chippee Ridge fell to the Americans, who pressed forward against all odds. The fearless corporal Jake Alex, a Serbian immigrant, led his platoon in a heroic charge, personally taking down five enemy soldiers and capturing 15 prisoners. By August 10th, it was clear that the Germans were withdrawing. The next day, the Battle of Amiens was over. A dim hope. The battle marked Germany's worst defeat in the war. German Kaiser Wilhelm II subsequently reckoned, quote, We have reached the limits of our capacity. The war must be terminated. The Battle of Amiens marked a significant turning point in World War I, bringing about a shift in the momentum of the conflict. The initial German strategy had been thwarted, leading to the establishment of entrenched positions on the Western Front. The Canadian Corps demonstrated immense bravery and resilience, earning over 3,000 decorations for their efforts, including multiple Victoria Crosses. Furthermore, 
the encounter served as a catalyst for the Hundred Days Campaign, a concerted Allied effort that ultimately culminated in the signing of the Armistice on November 11, 1918. As Philip Gibbs, a British war correspondent, put it, quote, The change has been greater in the minds of men than in the taking of territory. The Germans no longer have even a dim hope of victory on this Western Front. All they hope for now is to defend themselves long enough to gain peace by negotiation.